All right, hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Charles Gao, I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. And today it's my pleasure to introduce our current panel, winning at DFS using analytics. We have three, three great panelists here today. On the far right, we have Tawhid Zaman, professor at MIT. In the middle, we have Juan Pablo Vilma, also a professor at MIT. And immediately to my right, we have David Hunter, a PhD student at MIT. So without further ado, let's hand it off to Tawhid to start us off. All right, thanks everyone for having us today. So I see it's a pretty big crowd, so I guess a lot of interest in making that fantasy money. And today we'll be talking about how to actually make money consistently in daily fantasy sports. Now before we begin the talk, I want to talk about the background of how we got to this point in the story. So about a year ago, uh, David Scott Hunter, who I call Hunter, by the end of the talk you'll see why he got that nickname, um, wanted to do a project about fantasy football. So once I built an algorithm to use analytics, I actually draft a team for like old school, full season fantasy football, right? You have a draft with your buddies, play the same team the whole season. So the spring semester of his senior year, we build the algorithm with Juan Pablo. And then he becomes my PhD student because he applies to our MIT's Operating Research PhD program. So now the kid's my PhD student. So over the summer, we kind of like finish up the algorithm, ready to go for the new season. And then in August, we decided to switch it up and not do regular uh, fantasy football. We decided to do uh, fantasy football and DraftKings, right? Daily fantasy sports. And the reasons were threefold. First was in DraftKings, when you pick your players, there's no actual draft. So if I pick a player, I can pick it if somebody else picks that player. So it made our life easier picking the teams. The second thing was, at that time, if you remember back in August, like, the DraftKings ads were everywhere. So we're like, yeah, let's get part of this action, right? And the third reason was, you can make money in DraftKings, okay? So what we did was, in September, ready to go, run the algorithm. I tell Hunter, I'm like, dude, here's a thousand bucks of my money, okay? We're gonna play algorithm this weekend. If we win anything, 50-50 split of the winnings. If we lose it, it's gonna be all my loss, right? And the dude like has a heart attack, right? He's freaking out. I'm like, chill, dude, it's gonna be fine. Put the money down. We made like 600 bucks the first weekend, right? Not bad. So now I'm like, okay, I think this works. So the next week I'm like, okay, dude, here's $10,000 of my money. We're gonna put it down, same deal. 50-50 wins, um, losses, I take all the losses. And the dude like passed out. I'm like, yo, wake up, son, wake up, wake up. It's gonna be okay, right? Put the money down, we made like 8,000 bucks that weekend. Played a few more weeks with the winnings now. Um, in the end, we had about $10,000 of profit off of about a 10,000 investment, okay? So then we're like, this is fun. I like making money, but it's not really research because we have some analytics, but a lot of it was Hunter, knows football a lot, would pick the players based upon his kind of personal knowledge about what's happening in football. So we thought maybe we'll make it a bit more challenging. Also in football, we're playing these things called double ups or 50-50 contests where you win the money if you beat half the people in the contest, okay? So beating half the people is not too hard. And you know, you only get even money in the payoff. We wanted a kind of more bang for our buck. So we thought, let's play hockey. Because in hockey, we don't know anything about hockey. And we'll play like more difficult contests. And we'll see if just pure analytics can actually win us money in this game. So now Hunter can I tell you guys what we did. All right, Tawheed, thank you for the introduction. As he said, I'm David Hunter. And today, we'll be telling you about winning at Daily Fantasy Hockey using analytics. Before we get started, I'll give a five to 10 minute introduction basically of how daily fantasy hockey works on DraftKings. Oh, no. Let that man click. There we go. So for those of you that have played DraftKings before, you definitely recognize what this is. It's a lineup or a contest entry to one of the contests. Basically the structure is, is that you have you play a lineup with nine players, and DraftKings imposes some constraints on the lineups that you can create. So you must play two centers, three wings, two defenders, a goalie, and a utility player. A utility player is a skater, which is effectively a non-goalie. So a center, a defender, or a wing. Additionally, there's a budget constraint for the lineup that you create. So what you do is you pay money to DraftKings to get one country or sorry, one contest entry. And with that contest entry, you get 50,000 kind of virtual DraftKings dollars. And each player is assigned a salary, kind of based on their projected, like how, how well they're gonna do that night. And the constraint is, is the sum of the nine player salaries that you pick must be less than or equal to the $50,000 budget. Finally, there's a pretty interesting constraint, at least there's a constraint that we found the most interesting, is that the skaters that you pick, so the centers, the wings, the defender, and the utility player, must be on at least three distinct 
NHL teams. So this was a pretty interesting constraint in our opinion. Uh, now that you kind of got basically how the constraints are done, we'll go into basically how the scoring works. So for the skaters, the scoring is three points for a goal, two points for an assist, 0 0.5 points for a block shot, and additionally there are bonuses for hat tricks, uh, shootout goals, but we won't focus necessarily on that. The fact that it's three points for a goal and two points for an, assi uh, an assist is actually pretty astonishing, especially when you consider how frequently assists occur in hockey. Now in basketball, there can be one assist on a goal or on a score, but in hockey, there's a potential for two assists on each goal. So for instance, if I pass to Tawheed and Tawheed passes to Juan Pablo, and by some miracle, Juan Pablo scores, <laughs> Juan Pablo can get three points for the goal, 0 0.5 points for the shot on goal, and Tawheed and I can each potentially get two points for an assist. So in a mere seconds, you have the potential of getting 7.5 points if you had all three of us. Now, it does not take any analytics to know that you should never play people like us, maybe depending on physique, you can just see that, and obviously, we're not uh, available options in DraftKings. Now, since you kind of got how the constraints work and the goal of the game, we'll go into the contest that we considered. Once the clicker works, okay. So we considered 40 days worth of sniper payoff structure data. So for the payoff that we're showing you, it's $4,000 for first place, 3,000 for second, 2,000 for third, et cetera. And for all the sniper contests that we played, it was $3 to enter. And for this particular one, there's 22,000 approximately entrants. Um, basically the payout structure kind of varied day to day, but it was still roughly a scaling of what you see. So basically a lot of the money was near the top, so it was very top heavy. So our goal was to score in the top 10, top 20, maybe top 30. We really wanted to get in the top end using analytics. Now that we've kind of explained to you our goals, we will talk about the previous knowledge that we had going into the problem. So none of us really knew anything about hockey. Matter of fact, none of us had watched hockey before. None of us had obviously played hockey. However, the only hockey that we were exposed to, sorry, was from the Mighty Ducks movies. For instance, we knew that we wanted to play players like Adam Banks, the goal scorers. Maybe we wanted Charlie Conway with his triple deke, um, the knuckle puck guy. We basically wanted to find the players that are good. However, we did not have the knowledge of which NHL players were good. So to compensate for this lack of hockey knowledge, luckily, we knew some analytics. So we'd taken MIT courses in analytics. In my case, they teach the courses. I'm sure, I know there's some MBAs in the uh, audience who have taken their courses. So we knew some analytics. So we're hoping we can compensate for this lack of hockey knowledge with analytics. Um, so now that we've explained the structure, we'll finally show you some of the data. So here's the histogram for uh, a contest point performance. So basically this is data for one of the DraftKings Snipers contests. On the uh, x-axis is points, and on the y-axis is frequency. And do remember that this is for 22,000 entrants. So as you can see, roughly the points are, the majority of the points are between roughly 20 and 38 points, roughly. Um, and because there's 22,000 entrants, while it looks like no one scores in the 50 to 60 range, that's actually kind of where you have to be to really make the money. So to give you a visual of where the money is, to at least break even, which is a good minimum goal, I would assume, you have to score in at least the green region. So you have to roughly score 38 points for this contest. It varies a lot day to day, but for the contest uh, that we use for the data, it was 38 points. Additionally, to really get top 10, top 20, top 30, you need to reach the money areas. So you need to be in the 50 to 60 point range to really achieve our goal. So you might be asking yourselves, were we able to do it? You're damn right we did it. Give me the clicker, son. <laughs> okay, so we started playing our algorithm on November 15th, and we come in first place on this contest, okay? Then the 16th, again, we're in like third place, 21st place, right? We're going back to back here, right? 17th, we win again. Um, there we go, 23rd, we're winning again. So we're winning over and over and over again, getting the top 10 almost consistently. Like for a while, we weren't draft kings, we were draft gods, okay? <laughs> and we attract the attention of the draft king's leadership. So my man, John Aguiar, is an audience here, yeah. He emails me saying, hey, 
You want to come and see a Patriots game in the DraftKings Skybox at Foxborough? And we're like, yeah, that sounds awesome, right? So me and Hunter go down the game. Um, we meet the CEO, Jason Robbins. It's a really great time. And then at that game, John tells us, guys, just want to let you know that the rules will be modified for the contest just to make it more fair. So right now it's 200 lineups you could enter in a contest for one person. We're going to make that 100, OK? I'm like, that's fine. That's life. You know, I wasn't mad. I was like, you know what? We actually broke DraftKings. We made the rules change. But even with the rule changes, we still kept winning. So this is in December, a few days later. We played again. We came in first place. So you know, we were just kind of killing it every day, over and over again, right? We made like tons and tons and tons of money, you know? Yo. Oh yeah, JP, the wet blanket, got to make me say this disclaimer. <laughs> uh, all profits are in the process of being a charity. <laughs> so this is technically a research project because it involves a PhD student. So we couldn't keep the money, so a lot of like legal realms at MIT. We're given all the money, which ends up being about with the football and the hockey combined, $24,000 to a charity. All right, so that's happening now. So now you guys know that we actually did win, so this is for real, we're not messing around here. So I'll let Hunter tell you guys exactly what we did. All right, so let's get back to the journey of how we actually did it. We'll first discuss our first attempt. So. We knew nothing about hockey, our first attempt. We were going to try to emulate the success of the one team that we did know, and that was the Mighty Ducks. So we went out. We knew no NHL players, so we searched for all the Minnesotans and Canadians we could find, and we finally figured out nine NHL players. So we tried to play these players. For those of you that know something about the NHL, we have, you might recognize some of these players. We have Steven Stamkos, Patrick Kane, Alex Ovechkin, Jonathan Taze, Sidney Crosby, Yamir Yager, Shea Weber, Henrik Lundqvist, and the Team USA captain, Zach Parisi. I'm very happy I was able to memorize that. Um, however, these players are all studs. Everyone knows they're good. So this does not satisfy the DraftKings budget constraint. So we basically broke the budget constraint. So this lineup wasn't feasible, so we're going to have to basically try a new attempt. What we learned after a little while of creating these feasible lineups is that the problem of creating a feasible lineup was a little bit like a puzzle. However, it wasn't like the traditional number puzzle that all of us were used to from our experiences at MIT. Instead of being with numbers, this was a puzzle with hockey players. So it was a little bit different. After a while of kind of trying and figuring it out, we realized this puzzle was not necessarily too difficult. We were able to create feasible lineups. And here is an example of our first feasible lineup that we created, one of the first entries into DraftKings for hockey for us. And as you can see, it satisfies the budget constraints. The salary is sum to, I think, 49900 so it's less than 50000 The position constraints, we satisfy them. And additionally, we have the three different team constraints, so we create a feasible lineup. So this is feasible, but not necessarily very good, because this was a very naive approach to a problem that we're doing. We're just trying to create feasible lineups and submit them in. So going back, and just so you guys remember, the dark blue line is kind of just a continuous approximation of the histogram. This is just giving you a visual interpretation of where we want to be. And the red plot now is the uh, distribution for one of our naive approach lineups. So as you can see, we have virtually no chance of reaching the uh, green money, or the green area. So we have virtually no chance of even breaking even, and additionally, we're not reaching our goal. We are not reaching the money. If we were to submit lineups from this approach, we were destined to go broke. So now, as a graduate student in this relationship, this is when I was worried. Because I knew we were going to have to increase our mean point somehow. So I went into our meeting for the week, and Tawhid and Juan Pablo were talking about an overly complicated multivariate Gaussian mixture model to model points for every player, and additionally, to model the co correlations and covariances for every pairwise player. And it seemed like a difficult problem. Luckily for me, and I was extremely thankful, that there exists astonishingly accurate expert predictions <clears throat> that we can use, basically, to get a metric for how well a player will do in a given night. And we didn't necessarily want to reinvent the wheel. If we could use these, pro these predictions it, to give us an idea of how well, we need, or how well a player was going to do, we'll definitely take that and use that information. So now the puzzle that we initially considered is slightly more difficult, but still very reasonable. 
We're still trying to solve the feasibility problem of creating a feasible NHL hockey lineup for DraftKings, but additionally, we'd like to maximize points. Now, it's not necessarily too difficult of a problem, but still a little bit more difficult. So here was our old lineup. Our, um, this lineup was feasible, but once again, not very good. And now using these uh, predictions, we'd like to maximize mean or projected points subject to these feasibility constraints. And as you can see now, we have some players that, for those of you that know hockey, you, you recognize them. We finally know how to play some players that are pretty good. Alex Ovechkin, David Backus, Claude Giroux, Andrew Ladd, Braden Holpe. So we have some players. And additionally, um, we're, sa we're satisfying the constraints. And before, we were getting approximately 12 points on average just with our naive approach. And just by using these expert predictions, we're able to kind of get a free 11 points on average and increase our average to 23 points. So we're very happy about this. It saved some time for us. So for the second attempt, if we return to the population frequency plot, for our first attempt, our naive approach, just to reiterate, we're, not, we're basically losing money with every entry we considered, or entered. So by using these expert predictions, we're able to increase our mean, and finally we're able to break even some of the times, not necessarily all the time, or not necessarily even very often, but at least now we had a, we had a chance of breaking even. Additionally, However, we did not have any chance of reaching the money. So we still had not achieved our goal. Once again, as a graduate student, I was worried because I knew, um, or so basically now, is we were looking for a way to fix, to improve on what we were doing before. So I went, I talked to Juan Pablo, who teaches data models and decisions. He was telling me something about the three Ds of finance. I've never heard this before, but I guess the three Ds of finance are diversify, Diversify, diversify. I'm told, as an, a math undergrad major, I did not necessarily know what this meant. However, he assured me that this effectively meant that we uh, did not want to put all of our eggs in one basket. So as a graduate student, what are we going to do and what am I going to do? Well, we're going to ignore our, our advisor's advice and we're going to put all of our eggs in one basket. Actually, I'm joking, obviously. Juan Pablo also uh, realized that what we really needed to do was increase the variance of our distribution. So we had some positive probability of reaching the money. So to go back to our population frequency plot from our second attempt using the expert predictions, by, what we were hoping for basically is that we'd increase the variance substantially so we had a large probability of breaking even. And additionally, we finally would have some positive probability of reaching the money. So how are we going to do this? As a graduate student, once again, I'm always worrying. I was very worried. I thought I was going to have to go and estimate the covariance matrix. So for every night, that would be in dimension the number of players playing that night by the number of players playing that night. I was going to have to get the variance for every player, the pairwise covariance. Maybe I could assume some sparsity. Maybe players not playing in the same game that night are uncorrelated. So it could be, maybe I could simplify this. However, let's say I did, was able to estimate the covariance matrix. Now, in finance, we know that they're able to minimize variance subject to a mean return. And this problem is relatively similar. However, we want to maximize variance subject to a mean expected points. So I go into Juan Pablo's office, and Juan Pablo specializes in integer programming, and I ask him, Juan Pablo, can we solve this problem? Nope. It's not a convex optimization problem. Very, very hard to solve. So even if we had the covariance matrix, maybe we wouldn't be able to solve this problem. So we search for something, basically, that could kind of estimate this covariance matrix. Maybe we could get some structure of how the sparsity of the matrix works. Obviously, it goes with your intuition that players on the same team are positively correlated. For instance, if one player on the team scores, there's a positive probability another player on that team gets the assist. So we'd like to use this positive correlation in creating our lineups to increase the variance of our distribution. However, in hockey, there is even a stronger correlation besides just the team correlation. So players on the same line are strongly po positively correlated. A line is effectively three players, a center and two wings. In this example, Jonathan Taze, Tivo Teravainen, and Marion Hossa are on a line together. Um, and they're likely to be on the ice at the same time together. Now, I'm sure some of you have noticed this as an, isn't even a picture 
from a real NHL game. It's a picture from my EA Sports NHL video game on Xbox. It was a great day when I could convince my advisors that playing a video game was part of research. Um, so basically, we'd like to use this correlation information. And furthermore, who is on what line is pu pretty much publicly available information. We can go in the morning, we can get this line information, and then we can use it when we're creating lineups for DraftKings. <clears throat> furthermore, there is a correlation that we want to avoid. And once again, this should kind of make intuitive sense to you. Goalies and the skaters that they are opposing are negatively correlated. Just to kind of hammer in the point, if you have a skater and you also have the goalie that the skater is opposing, uh, if the skater scores naturally or usually, you get 3.5 points. However, because you have the goalie and you get negative one points for a goal allowed, that is a net 2.5 points. Additionally, there, if the goalie gets scored on, there's a lower probability that that goalie is going to win the game. And additionally, also, if the goalie gets scored on, you're also not getting that shutout bonus. So you kind of want to avoid this negative correlation to increase the variance. So now we'll go back to our initial kind of idea of creating lineups. And I'm about to kind of walk you through a greedy approach of using this uh, correlation information to create lineups. So for the night considered, we have that the Philadelphia Flyers first line featuring Claude Giroux and his line mates are projected to do well. So we'd like to play this line together in our lineup. And furthermore, we'd like to play the New York Rangers first line because they're also projected to do well. So we play Rick Nash, Derek Stepan, and also their line mates. Now we've satisfied the two center uh, position constraints, three wing uh, position constraints, and the utility position constraints. So we need to play a defender. And we're going to, once again, take advantage of the structural correlation between players on the New York Rangers. And we're going to play a defender on the New York Rangers with the New York Rangers line that we're using. Now we have to satisfy the three team constraints, and we must play a defender. So we have to play a defender that's obviously not on the Rangers or the Flyers. So we choose to play John Carlson on the Washington Capitals. Uh, lastly, we need to play a goalie that is not opposing the Rangers, the Capitals, or the Flyers. So we choose to play Braden Holpe of the Washington Capitals. Now, how I kind of describe the decision-making process is definitely a greedy approach. We don't just want to select the best line that's available that night. Our true goal is to maximize points subject to the DraftKings constraint, and additionally subject to the constraint that we want to have some structural correlation that we use in this problem. So now, by using these structural correlations, just see what we're able to do. Once again, here's the frequency plot for our second attempt we're able to successfully increase our variance. So now we succeed. We have some positive probability of breaking even, relatively large, not necessarily too large. And finally, we are able to have some positive probability of reaching the money. So we have some positive probability of getting that top 10, top 20 that we desire. However, we're only submitting one lineup from how we described it to you. Uh, in this scenario. So really the probabilities are not necessarily very high. And let's say the line that we pick does not do well that night. Then obviously we're not even going to make money, so we're not achieving our goal. So from before we have one egg, or we have one basket full of eggs, what we'd really like to do is have a ton of different uh, baskets, all for all of different eggs. So for instance, we have the New York Rangers line, in one of our baskets, however, if Rick Nash doesn't do well, we don't really care because we're going to have, let's say, 100, 200, 300 more baskets. It won't matter too much to us. So to review, what we'd like to do is we'd like to satisfy the DraftKings constraints. Additionally, we'd like to basically maximize some aggregation of projected points. And finally, we'd like to incorporate this structural correlation into our model. And lastly, we don't want to solve this problem once. We want to be able to solve it 200 or 300 times. So I'd like to effectively have a lot of baskets. And you might be asking yourselves, how can you do it? Well, if you were to do it by hand, it would probably take several hours. 
Uh, I don't want to get Juan Pablo excited with qualifying exam questions. I don't have to walk into the quals next year and have a question about Rick Nash being projected some points and what's the optimal lineup. So I don't want to get him excited on that. Furthermore, there is also kind of a time constraint. So hockey is similar in a, a way to baseball. In baseball, the goalies don't play every day. It's the same way for hockey, or sorry, in baseball, the pitchers don't play every day. And it's the same way for hockey. Goalies do not play every day, so we need to be able to go out, get this information, and then use this information in our decision-making process. So just to kind of give a mathematical interpretation of what we're doing, this is the integer programming formulation of the problem that we are trying to solve. So we're kind of trying to maximize some form of projected points subject to budget constraints, subject to using some form of structural correlation in creating our lineups. And now you might be asking yourselves, how can you do it? So of course, this is the part where it's a shameless plug. If you understand analytics, you understand the slide that, was just the, that Hunter just shown. If not, well, one of your options is to actually learn analytics. And you can learn analytics at MIT. So let me just tell you a little bit about the program. So if you're just coming out of high school, you could major in business analytics at MIT. And this is the new major that started this year. If you're actually just graduating from college, you could go and take and, and apply to MIT Sloan's Master of Business Analytics, which is a one-year program that's also starting this year. And again, you'll learn everything you need in, in both these programs. Now, you've been out for a while working, and you also have some managerial interests, you'll, and you take the MBA or apply to the MBA program at Sloan, then in the first year, you're already going to learn analytics. In fact, at the core of uh, the MBA program, there's a course called DMD, Data Models and Decisions. And Everything you need to be able to do what we did, with what we did here in, uh, for fantasy sports, you will learn in DMD. So if you're a first year MBA student, you already know everything you need to do to replicate and improve our, what, what you actually just saw. In fact, uh, there's many other classes you can take in the MBA program. For instance, the Analytics Edge is another class that goes into analytics. And in a few weeks, I believe, we're actually going to be giving an in-depth version of this talk where we're actually going to go over all the technical details on how to actually make this work. And finally, if you want to be a badass in analytics like Hunter here, you can enroll in the PET program in operations research, which is what he's studying right now. Now, I know that not everybody has time to spend two years studying analytics to actually try to go play daily fantasy football or daily fantasy hockey. So we're going to give you a, diff a second option. So he, this is the math, but this math translates into software. So we're actually going to give you the software. So we're going to put all the code that actually we use to be able to solve these problems online. You're going to be able to download it. It's fairly easy to use. And thanks to, in part, for some software developers that actually occurred at MIT. So this is based on a new programming language called Julia, which was developed at MIT. And in a, mathematical program, in a library for mathematical programming, the Julia Library for Mathematical Programming, or JUMP, which allows you to transform all these mixed integer programming problems fairly easily into code that you can use. And the great thing about all this is that Jump, Julia, and the code is all free. You can just download it and use it. The only thing that you need is you need some software that will allow you to solve these optimization problems. But fortunately, there's also free software for that. Now, you pay for what you get. So there's free software and paid software. If you can see here in the slide, I'm showing you um, I guess we're missing some slides. So the first one is uh, uh, CBC, which is an open source software from an uh, initiative from IBM, from CoinOR. The second graph is actually um, GLPK, which is a software that's from GNU. It's also open source. And the last bar is actually uh, Gurobi, which is a paid software for solving optimization problems. And what you're seeing here is essentially box plots or how long it took us to actually solve every single one of the optimization problems you need to solve for one day of daily fantasy uh, hockey. And you'll see that definitely the commercial solver is much faster. But if you look at the free software that you can download on your own without paying anything, it takes about four minutes. And as we discussed, you pretty much have about 30 minutes to be able to solve these problems. OK, so with the software we're giving you, you can immediately go and actually use this. Now, again, if you actually are interested in learning analytics, there's chances you can actually Picker software, modify it, improve it, and do much more elaborate models. And that's where perhaps we actually want to go with the commercial version of the software. So how can you learn all this? We're going to put the paper online very soon. So Tawhid's going to tell you a little bit about that.
Thanks, dude. Okay, so like we said, this is a research project technically, so we had a research paper about it. So click, yeah. So in the paper, we actually explore this problem in much more detail. So for, for instance, we consider different kinds of structural correlations, how to use them in the model, so different kinds of strategies. We write that integer program in different kinds of ways to kind of capture different types of stacking of lineups, so different IP formulations. We also take our prediction models and kind of tweak them a bit, put more information in them, and you see how they perform on the, uh, on the graph things thing, so different prediction models. And finally, this issue about number of lineups, we actually explored if you change how many lineups you enter in the contest, 100, 200, 300, you actually perform better. All the details are kind of in the paper there, which you can find online. It should be posted in a couple of days, so check my website or our website to see the paper's link, okay? So now you've kind of seen that with analytics, we can do it. We can win this stuff, right? And now the paper is going to be online. The code's online. So now you can do it. Wait. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we like finished a bit early, so if there's any like questions, I think we can take questions, right? Is that cool? Yeah, over there. Uh, I think you know a number of states have tried to restrict daily fantasy sports, yep. including New York, yep. where for a while you couldn't play it at all. Yep. Uh, my question to you is that based on what you've done so far, do you think there's any element of chance in daily fantasy sports? Okay, that's an excellent question, totally fair question. Um, so I would say that there's some uncertainty there. There's some randomness, right? Like your line could just crap out that night. But if you're smart about it, you can bias the odds in your favor, OK? And the way these contests work is I don't got to be absolutely good. I just got to be better than the rest of the people, OK? So there is some chance. But if you're smart about it, you can bias the odds in your favor. So it's like a calculator risk. It's like investing in the stock market, right? So it's not really gambling. It's more like calculated risk you're taking there. Anything else? Yeah. Um, what kind of spin do you put on the rotor renders and CSS versus like? Oh, I think I'll let Hunter speak about that stuff. So the question is what kind of spend or? Like spend. Kind of spin do you add your own? Ah, what kind of oh. spin? Yeah, the model. So we try to aggregate them effectively, but additionally, we found that necessarily not the most accurate predictions do the best. Sometimes you just want to find value. So what we do is we try to bias uh, the aggregation sometimes in terms of whether or not a goalie is going to win. Because a goalie, win, a goalie winning is so, so important, we're willing to play like two or three goalies just so we can increase the probability of our like winning, of the goalie winning. So that's kind of one of the ways we bias it. We consider a few other ways. Um, but that's probably the big one, and that's one that we saw. Even though those predictions weren't necessarily more accurate, it actually led to a higher profit margin. So that's kind of an interesting research question, too, why that is. So I'll hand over here. You, sir. So I think the only data we use is just the numbers from uh, Daily Fantasy Nerd and Roto Grinders, just their point predictions. Um, I think we also incorporated something about win probabilities. Yes. I think those sites also tell you what is the chance this team is going to win the game. That's also in our model for we kind of pick which goalies to kind of prefer. But other than that, there's nothing beyond that. It's very, very simple prediction data. Like our strength here is not the predictions. It's really this integer programming optimization way of doing it, right? That's enough to beat the population. Yeah. Yep. Yes. So, like, what's the average number of entries you would enter in one contest in order to consider that, like, you have a chance of winning? Like, what's the, what's so, the population? empirically, like, when we played this, we play as many as possible. Right? Like, let's just throw everything in there. Who cares, right? Um, we see in our kind of, in the paper, some of our computer simulations that it, it's hard to say, like, is it a big deal, 100 versus 200 lineups? We don't see that much of a difference, really, right? Not the profit margin actually goes down in general with the number of lineups, but you're kind of decreasing your variance of the profit by playing more lineups is the idea. So it seems like just uh, if you're playing just to go for broke, just play as many as you can, right? Because you just want to hit that upper tail once in a while. Yeah. You, sir. Yep, kind of. You know, you've done any to say where your, your results are versus the D score off of the normal random distribution versus the field that's right there, the people playing in the contest, right? 
Yeah, so we have actually compared our method to other methods, except for saying we play the contest and we beat them. Okay, so we don't actually know are we like optimal in some kind of mathematical, theoretical sense. We just know this thing worked. And for four days, it worked really, really well. So I would, I would add something interesting is that now that the software is out there and you guys can use it and, in, and you actually can improve it, I'd be very interested to see what actually happens <laughs> when everybody starts playing with this because it's, things are going to change. Yep. Yep. So in the paper, we can discuss that. We don't actually do basketball or baseball or any other sports, but the ideas from hockey directly map onto those sports. So what is the ideas from here? We have like constraints in the lines. There are constraints and lineups in those sports. We have structural correlations, right? In baseball, the correlations are like the batters in the same team are positively correlated. The pitcher and the batter have a negative correlation, kind of like hockey. So that idea can play in, um, in baseball. In basketball, probably similar kind of structural correlation exists. So not actual like measuring the value of the correlation coefficient, but just you know that they're going to be kind of together in a positive way. And the beauty of our approach is that just those structural correlations can be encoded in an integer program. No actual number, just like these players should be together, these players shouldn't be together. You have their points prediction from Rotor Grinders, Daily Fantasy Nerd. Now build me the best lineups that maximize your points with these kind of constraints there. So actually, it's really robust to like your kind of prediction models that you put in there. Uh, yeah, there. Uh, so in the contest that you were playing in, you were playing in the sniper sort of style? All these top-heavy contests. Where you're going for the upper tail. Exactly. The if you were playing in a contest that rewarded more broadly, mm -hmm. do you think you would perform worse? All right, so if you play a double up or a 50-50 with our approach, you will break even, right? Because you saw our tail kind of like just spreads everywhere, 50-50. And the payoffs there are like kind of even, right? Nothing here and like equal amount here. So you don't want to play double ups and 50-50s this way. In fact, though we played the double ups in football was we actually maximize points trying to minimize the variance of the lineups, right? So it's like the opposite way here. This game is like, you know, it's hit or miss. You got to either make it to the top or it's nothing, right? So you kind of shoot for the moon. So a very different idea strategy for these guys versus double ups. Okay. Yeah. I feel like a lot of us, when we build them on our own, it's like, crap, I have a thousand bucks left. I have to spend it, right? And we, and we go change out players. But How do we do? Guys in. Uh, I'm not totally sure looking at it. We, there's been times where we'll have lineups that are like 47,000, right? We don't really look too much into it, to be honest, because we don't know which players usually are good just looking at it visually. So we just trusted it. Um, it would be an interesting problem. I guess the logic would be is that because we found that the predictions were so accurate in general, and DraftKings does such a good job of pricing the players, yeah, that we'd find it's close to 50,000, but we're never worried if we're like far short of that. So, so from pure optimization perspective, that's actually, it happens a lot. That's what actually makes these problems hard is that the solution that's the best might actually not hit that constraint, and that, that's just, it's not intuitive. You would think that, oh, I'm leaving money on the table, but you're not. And that's very hard to, to realize if you don't have a, a, a software that guarantees that it's the best. Yeah, over here. Ah, okay, so the way we kind of did it, right, we solved that problem once to get the first line up. Then we tell the next time you solve it, give me something the same way, but like here's a constraint. Don't have more than like six players overlapping with the previous guy, right? Solve it again. Then we like solve it again, now give me again, no more than six players with the first two guys. Solve it over and over and over again. So you're thinking like probably the first lineup is like gonna be the best one, right? Because it's the most freely created lineup and they're gonna get worse progressively. But in like in the results, which ones actually won the contest? Do we ever check that? The, the first lineup in general was the most profitable. It was like the first or second, third lineup in general we found. And in the paper, we basically have a graph where it's like submitting one through 300 lineups, what would your profit be? And varying like a ton of strategies. And I'm sure you, like, people could continue that approach. What, when you start breaking, how many lineups do you need to break even? The first lineup off the bat, well, it depends on the strategy which, for which lineup breaks average, even. Or what's the minimum number of lineups you need to? The first lineup in general breaks even. 
okay. with the structural correlation strategy. However, with the strategy that doesn't use a structural correlation, in general, we find that we lose money pretty consistently. Yeah, right over here. Well, to be honest with you, we kind of retire from the game. So we finish in like tax year 2015, right? Then we stop playing because then I have to pay taxes on my money and they give to charity. But yeah, I mean, once the code is out there, right, anybody can take it, play it, and then like what's going to happen with like that histogram Hunter showed or like the population of 35 points, it might go up to like, you know, 38 points. And it might get a little bit less of a variance because everybody's doing the same thing. So it's going to get harder, right? But that's just life. Yeah. Yeah, why we pick hockey, dude? Because we don't know about hockey. Yeah, we, just, <laughs> we didn't know about just hockey. Let's like, try it out there. Why not? It was hockey season. <laughs> yep, over here. Uh, two questions. First, is it it's the notion when you play daily fantasy, you want a stud in your lineup. You want a guy who costs expensive. Did, was there ever times where you were most profitable with a lineup of just average Joes, basically, where you had a set of, like, six grand guys and no one above, say, eight? Hmm. And second question is, was there a particular position in hockey for Hunter? Were we always getting a goalie stud or like a center stud? So for the stud, because we, in practice, we considered like this goalie biasing. We were trying to bias the goalies, the goalies that are projected to win. So in general, yes, we spent a lot of money on the goalies. And what was the first question again? I apologize. Um, were the, like, say your most profitable lineups, was there always, for example, one or two players over 8K? Or okay. Yeah, so when we constructed lineups, we did varying strategies, and one of the strategies we considered is playing like a complete power play, for instance, and it was a matter of fact, whereas teams that weren't very good, uh, with players that were not very good, but that night they just went off. So the power play construction with those cheap players did very well. So yes, I guess the answer to your question is yes. I would, I would say um, it is very important. Maybe it is, yes, the most valuable. So if you are constructing 200 lineups, it's like really valuable to have like three or four goalies you're using for those lineups that is going to win. So yes, I'd say it's very valuable. In fact, one thing we kind of fixed in our model, like what made us go from like regular players to like gods was we said, you know what, these goalies, like we kind of know which ones are going to win because they have these game predictions. Let's bias our algorithm by picking the goalies more often that are going to win more points. We call it goalie biasing. When we put that into our model, that's when we became gods. So that trick kind of really helped us. So yeah, I think the goalie was like, I think I fixed the problem. Like, I think I have time for one more question. Who's the organizer here? Tahiti, he's been asking. In front of me. Oh, yeah, sure, dude. <laughs> uh, so two quick questions. You, know, you mentioned that you don't take a goalie if you have a line. We try to avoid that, yep. What about if you have, let's say Tampa's playing against Philly, would you take a pen? Ah. That does not matter. Doesn't matter, right? Yeah. So those correlation isn't really that strong, right? They can both score a ton of points, but the goalie in the line does have like a negative correlation. Okay. And also, so yeah, sure. And also you mentioned how you take a line. Would you take a power play line that plays together? We considered that, yeah. We did consider that in the paper. And to your first question, too, we also considered kind of like uh, playing lines also on the game sometimes. And you can check out all the strategies, too, with the code. You can just try it out, so... All right, so I think we'll stop there. We'll be around for more questions. If you have more questions to ask us. But again, thank you for coming out. Get the code, make that money. I, I just want to